Hello everybody. Welcome to another Bright Talk session. And my name is Banjo Devdas. I'm the founder CEO of Pluto7. We are a Google preferred partner when it comes to machine learning and AI analytics work. And uh, today I will be talking to you about how machine learning and AI we see being implemented when I say in real life, in real business, and uh, hope you see the value of machine learning and AI beyond just the hype that as it appears. <clears throat> just to set a little bit of context, uh, when we work with our customers uh, in applying machine learning and AI, uh, it's not so much just about a science experiment or a science project where that's what most of the projects end up being early stage in a typical evolving technology, but when we work on it, it's typically to solve a real world business case. And in the in the spaces, the examples that I'll quote will range from retail, manufacturing, some high tech companies, healthcare, and so on. So when we, when we work with these companies, it's really about solving some of their business problems. It could be in the marketing, supply chain, sales, and our customers that I refer to are primarily in uh, US and some in India. And when we do this, what's important is to think about uh, uh, machine learning and AI, not, so much, not just as a technology, but a technology that enables and empowers either your current business, be it an enterprise or a mid-market uh, business, or even in some cases, SMB customers as well as uh, look at how it uh, changes or disrupts your business or market. Uh, if you look at internet, what it did, it, it changed the way people do business. Um, this machine learning and AI is now expected to go even beyond and embed itself in the form of uh, uh, helping you making decisions in your various business processes or in some cases, new businesses will evolve because of machine learning and AI. Uh, and uh, hopefully at the end of this conversation, you'll realize why some of it is possible. When we work with customers, and I personally have been involved with about 250 plus customer conversations, experimentations, innovations to production deployments, uh, working with customers side by side with an excellent partner like Google, uh, who really is in the forefront of uh, uh, not only championing machine learning and AI, they have been using internally uh, thousands of machine learning models to run their own business. So it comes with sheer decades of experience knowledge, which we overlay that with our domain experience with enterprises and now embed that into solving real world business problems. To make it all real, I will start off with one real example of how machine learning model improved the taste of beer. I'll try to play the video. If you if you can't uh, see the video or hear the audio for some reason, uh, you can always search on YouTube on preventive maintenance, AB and Bell, Pluto 7, and so on. And also there's a case study published on the subject. Uh, first, I'll summarize what this is all about, and I'll play about a 30-second video, and then I'll jump on to the conversation again to help you articulate the business value and so on. So here we go. AB InBev is one of the largest brewing companies in the entire world. He brands basically for Budweiser, Bud Light, and Stella Art Farm. Brewing is such an old industry. The last hundred years. And so we've started to use technology to digitally transform our operations. Our innovation team at AB InBev teams up with Google and Pluto 7 to find a way to extend the life of each K filter run, which is a process where the beer has certain particles that have come from fermentation. We have these filters that are set up in which the beer turbidity level, which is how clear the beer is, has to get below a certain threshold. So what you have is a multi variable problem where you reach a certain threshold. The machine has to be shut down. It's a balancing act because you have to keep that turbidity level below the required amount for that brand. Okay. Going back to the presentation, um, 
what we saw here is, uh, in this case, it is not just the, sorry, just want to make sure that you are seeing the screen. All right. The business problem here was uh, uh, cleaning the beer filter so that the beer that you get in your beer bottle or can is as clear and at the level of uh, quality that it needs to be. And here human versus a machine model, machine learning model based uh, uh, determination of when to clear the filter uh, had an accuracy of 20 plus percentage uh, approximately here, give it here and there. Uh, having millions of dollars of saving. So this was also one of the projects uh, that was recognized by Gartner as top six innovation in the world. Now, the, it's really about the business impact that you made we make with these innovations. Uh, that's what makes the difference. Uh, and many times when you think about the business problem, our uh, customers, pretty much the C-level executives that we work with or, or uh, uh, VPs and directors who drive innovation, for these enterprises, don't necessarily come and ask us and tell me the most sophisticated machine learning model to use or a deep learning model to use or when and how they should embed that into which technology and so on. Those are given. We have to have answers for that as Google certified experts. What they ask us from a business perspective is the much more uh, bigger uh, business directional problems or, or business impacting uh, impacting uh, elements of you know knowing their customers and markets better, running the operations better, or running their business more efficiently so that they can be more profitable and with better customer experience. If I take this slide about 20 or 30 years back, I don't think the CXOs would have changed anything in this slide for the most part, except for maybe the word online at the bottom right corner. Because the term online of internet-based selling was not that common those days. Now, having said that, uh, why is that element important? The element, this conversation uh, in this regard of, you know, why this slide remains the same even if you take 30 years from now is important is the problems that you try to solve for businesses don't necessarily change for the most part. They are still about innovating quickly and getting better ideas to market, making sure that you're improving the productivity, your, your security compliance, supply chain, and customer experience. So those don't change. What changes is the KPIs, the bars, and the metrics that are set to measure those change. Because now the customers who were happy with the 10-day shipment now are not happy even with the one-day shipment. They want one-hour shipment, right? Or they want to be, when there is a defect in the product, they want an immediate reaction from the company. Or if you're sending an email campaign, they want it very, very targeted, which really matters to them. Otherwise, they're tired of 500 emails. So the, the, those metrics and uh, expectations have changed, but the problems necessarily still remain the same. When we work with customers, we are solving these problems using machine learning primarily to drive more revenue, you know, they, they would like to acquire more customers, either by whether it's in a physical store interaction in a furniture shop or online retailer who is trying to really understand and track their customers so that when they present a recommendation with a machine learning model, the recommendations are not only relevant, but it's attractive for them to make a purchase. Or when it comes to supply chain from how the goods move, where they are located to tracking and making sure that the human involvement is reduced not just from a labor cost perspective, but from a safety and efficiency standpoint, uh, or looking at machines and equipments which they rely on uh, to, uh, to manufacture, uh, if there's a failure to detect them much early on through preventive maintenance, those are machine learning models that we work with. And, and also, we work with uh, improving customer experience Knowing the customer more than what they themselves might know about their preference sometimes is the new expectation. And um, given the customer has so many choices, there are enterprises that we work with. These are very large enterprises where they have 2 million parts and there are 5 million such customers. And if you think about the combinations here, we run in tens of millions of active customer part combinations. 
it's hard for even a sales rep in that enterprise to really recommend a meaningful product for that customer knowing what other similar customers ordered uh, ordered uh, parts uh, or 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 uh, or products and and liked it and saw value in it uh, these are uh, challenges of enterprises given the customers expectations are rising and when it comes to scale and complexity and volumes of data uh, in some cases uh, first of all let's take a step back not every problem that we solve is a machine learning problem half of the world's problem that people think is a machine learning problem are not machine learning problems from my experience the other half of uh, that we think are machine learning problems uh let's say about 80% of them can be solved with very simple machine learning model a regression a time series a classification image recognition and so on really the bottom 5% are really the ones which requires uh, some really uh, deep thinking in terms of neural net designs and and picking the right models to optimize the accuracy level and those accuracy level depends on the user uh, the the industry and what problem you're solving the tolerance uh, and and so on right so let's get past the the whole uh, uh, drama or the hype beyond uh, you know like okay well, what's the right neural net model or deep learning model but 9 out of 10 times that's not what you should worry about you should worry about are you solving the right problem uh, and if you with we using ml if you are uh, how do you keep the model simple first before you make it more complex how do you blend your domain and the business expertise with the technology is what you need to worry about first and through our experience having solved these problems uh, like when it comes to understanding your customers so that or or serving your customers and then retaining your customers the various machine learning models and the problems that we have solved each one of these bullet points that you see here is a is a problem and then there's a corresponding ml model or solution that we built for these customers like for example well, do you want to know how many people walk into your store uh, today if you are a retailer or if you are selling snow uh, equipment uh, winter equipment or which is seasonal and so on maybe weather matters maybe traffic matters maybe uh, the local uh, sporting events matters uh so for that we we built a machine learning model to help determine the store traffic not just looking at historical patterns of store traffic but using internal and external data similarly when you're looking at email campaigns when you have hundreds of thousands of millions of customers uh nobody wants to get a spam even from a, um, a reputed brand they would like to know what's targeted for them where they will take some action and so on so and and for that uh, the scale at which you need to run the campaigns the volume of campaigns to be highly personalized not only one time but really learning the path of the customer interaction with you as a brand uh, needs to be carefully managed and sometimes you need a combination of what the customer's data third party data uh, second party data as well as data that's there in the google ads or uh or or web traffic in google analytics and so on so you have to blend all these things to get to a very targeted email campaign and those are things that we have worked with for large enterprises one of the on the supply side uh, or supply chain side uh, the example what i just quoted is uh, preventive maintenance where uh, you are looking at uh, a machine failing and all you're trying to make the machine learning model tell is based on the characteristics of uh, data that you see and applying feature engineering or domain expertise into it uh, have the machine learning model predict when the machine will fail well before the failure if you saw the video the large equipments these are not easy equipments or devices whether you're cleaning the filter or replacing a turbine and so on uh, they have lead times in terms of how soon or how long the you can do it uh, get the part and not only get the part but also replace the part for which you need to allocate labor and all of during this time you are talking about uh, downtimes and then we deal with uh, large automobile manufacturers some of the top 10 or top 20 in the world uh, we deal with the largest uh, uh, food processing companies to the largest equipment manufacturing companies 
uh, when they uh, talk about scale, uh, these are Fortune 100 companies, the complexity is very high. At the same time, it's not just the large enterprises that look for these problems to be solved. It's also the mid-sized customers, that, and in some cases, you'll be surprised, the, the SMB online uh, retailers that we work with, uh, on the like for example on the sales side uh, it's like they want to know propensity to buy will the customer buy the thirty dollar home good product or or another a pillow case or a cover or or will they buy uh, so and so equipment uh, or a goods for home um, they need to know the customer's interest in that three seconds window because if you lose the attention of the customer in the three seconds window without the right recommendations. Uh, then you lost the customer's attention. So the purchase is gone. The opportunity to sale is gone. Uh, similarly, when you look at uh, uh, other elements such as you know, knowing, you know, is your sales rep productivity in a large enterprise contact, uh, if, you, if you carefully observe the sales reps and which we have done in some of these large enterprises, they spend a lot of time looking through uh, about the prospecting customer. The prospecting customer they're looking at various internal and external data and trying to find out more about the customer so that when they pick up the phone or go in person to meet the customer, um, they are well equipped with the information. However, if they pick the wrong customer to go after who doesn't have the uh, potential either because you know their stock is declining, the revenue is declining, or there was a change in organization structure, or something happened because of which you don't think that the sale will happen, wouldn't you want to know even before you pick up the phone or or drive up? Absolutely, yes. And in that case, you would not even prioritize the deal. Instead, you would take another deal that you will chase. ML models built to recommend deals is what the, some of these uh, 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 machine learning models do. And uh, this is new way of thinking. This is new way of empowering people. Um, if one of our, uh, our our mission or goal that we work towards when we engage with customer is, how do you transform such that the current employees or, or the leaderships or, or the workforce uh, can do what they're good at but do even better? Let ML and AI help you with some decision making, with some better classification, with better recommendations, um, so that you your decisions the chances of your decision being right is much, much higher. And in some cases, if it's a repetitive job where you're, you're doing things which a machine learning model uh, can do much better, faster, and accurate, sooner or later, those jobs will be irrelevant. And uh, it's better to plan differently. When we work with our customers, um, they don't necessarily tell us um, just enable a machine learning model. Yeah, there are some customers who do that, but what's important is they, they want to know the journey. And if you look at uh, uh, supply chain uh, as an example, uh, we look at supply chain holistically and, and look at, hey, how do we how do you run your business today? And, and where are your pain points? Uh, what are the technologies you have put in place? Uh, what thresholds and limits have you hit? where your demand forecast accuracy has got to a certain level, but you're not able to do anything better, or your uh, uh, your ability to detect the defects in a product or, or defects in products has, has hit a certain limits uh, in spite of all the human inspection and the, and the equipment you have. Why is it you're not able to hit, uh, go past that? We look for such roadblocks where the value is quite clear and then pick those and build a machine learning AI model to help uh, help beat those KPIs or metrics for that particular use case, and it's not just about proving that you you can beat the KPI and metric, but also showing how this all can be fit into a journey for them, right? Um, and 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 you have to blend that with their people, process, data, existing systems, be it their SAP, Oracle, or or a data warehouse and so on. Uh, one of the things that uh, eventually our customers come to realization, especially in large enterprises, is uh, to run effective AI and machine learning models, you need to centralize data. And where is the best place to centralize the data uh, is typically on the cloud. And why is that so? Not only because of um, 
the accessibility, but price performance, <clears throat> cost, and the many uh, many good reasons why you want to put them on the cloud, and that's the realization that they come to. There are certain industries and vertical who uh, may or may not be able to move the cloud, so they choose to have a hybrid environment where part of it resides on the cloud and part of it resides on on-prem. That's probably going to be a reality for some of the enterprises at least. Uh, given that, uh, irrespective of how the technology platform shifts from uh, a pure uh, cloud to a hybrid to an on-prem and with partially cloud, uh, no matter which mix you land up with, <clears throat> when you enable machine learning and AI models, data centralization is going to be one of the key elements. You don't have to centralize the entire company data, but you have to look at which problems are you choosing to solve and those problems interrelated using the same data elements, then you want to set up a data warehouse for that. And uh, once you do get past that, you need to also think about, uh, is your decision making purely based on your internal data? Or do you prefer your customers and suppliers and partners also load the data into the same data warehouse? Uh, or do you want to bring some third party data like Dun & Bradstreet or any of these external data which makes your insights much more richer if, if that's how you make your decisions? And now, paint a holistic picture of how you build this journey, right? However, when it comes to the industry evolution and technologies, usually they are discussed in the context of uh, big data, Hadoop, and then and, and the, the journey can starts and continues for six, seven years before it normalizes and so on. So the Gartner High High Cycle fairly well depicts uh, how these, uh, uh, how these uh, technologies evolve. And uh, similarly, machine learning model goes through its hype on what it can or cannot do, and and uh, we are watching the Gartner cycle for this as well, and and so is the application developments and IoT and so on. At some point, they all converge, and and I personally believe that uh, the convergence is happening uh, pretty much starting now and somewhere in 2020, uh, where your big data, data centralizations, warehouses, data warehouses. Uh, with machine learning models generating real value and, and putting an application wrapper or layer on top of it so that the customers can interact meaningfully without uh, seeing all the complexities of an AI model and so on. Uh, that, when you combine that with sensor data, uh, you now have uh, what uh, we term it as smart applications. These uh, applications um, uh, will go into many of the uh, many of the new uh, galleries or uh, uh, or app stores equivalent, uh, like Google has AI Hub, and that's the new launch. Um, so we, we believe this is where the industry is going, and uh, we already are working with customers who are thinking and acting on these lines, and some of them are are amazing in terms of how they're thinking of the disruptive market. Uh, <clears throat> when you go underneath, let's take the supply chain customer as an experience, uh, as an example, um, underneath the, the common theme that you'll see when you deal with machine learning, AI, enablement for your business, one is you have different data sets. Although your supply chain, your supply chain is not doesn't exist by itself, uh, you very well know that what your customers like or don't like is what you should be stocking. Uh, that's your customer experience aspect of it. You also, as a manufacturing supply chain organization, which is at the center of this picture, need to know uh, what products not only are being are in, in stock and is in production or live, but what's in the pipeline so that if, if there's a new version of the same product coming in, then you want to get rid of that through a fire sale or discount and so on. Uh, your supply and demand doesn't exist by itself. They go hand in hand with the price discounts and so on. And all of this, uh, even if you have a phenomenal demand, but if you don't have the right supplier or party who can deliver the goods on time, then you're losing the business. So your manufacturing is really an orchestration of various data sources. And for, for all of that, uh, that's the point I was making earlier, which is interconnecting your data and, and the walls between uh, different enterprise organizations are coming down in this regard, and the enabler for that is really cloud and data warehouse on the cloud. Partly because it's uh, these 
functions were designed with process and accountabilities and organizational structures and systems because they need a certain amount of isolation. But now, when everybody is looking at the same data at the same time, the, the, the technology is enabling it. Uh, if you take Google Cloud as an example, BigQuery can query 100 billion rows in like 30 seconds. Uh, when you, when something as simple as that, even not even looking at machine learning as such, just having to be able to query 100 billion rows in 30 seconds itself is transformative. But most people don't see it that way. But a large enterprise making an aircraft or uh, or, or uh, who, who has to worry about millions of parts, or one of the largest coffee makers, when they think about uh, having uh, thousands of uh, stores worldwide, when they think about how they need to operationalize and, and operate such power itself is transformative because you're not wasting your time querying, searching, and even before you think about advanced decision making. <clears throat> then comes IOT, okay, beyond the data that the humans generate and capture and so on, um, we we now are talking about 50 billion IOT devices sitting in farm tractors to uh, to manufacturing plants to garbage cans sitting on the street to and, and the and the uh, and the possibilities go on and on and on, right? Whether you look at your homes getting smarter or your factories getting smarter or hospitals getting smarter. Uh, through sensors and devices. Uh, the common theme is the data needs to be centralized so that you can analyze. And, and unlike uh, human-generated data, where generally the, the data limitations are, are manageable, uh, IoT uh, data volumes, uh, by definition, are, are tend to be uh, more and more frequent, and, and in many cases, even streaming. So your data pipeline, how you design your data pipeline architecture, and, and also the new age thinking of, of transforming data in the pipeline uh, itself is uh, is very, uh, even for the technology world, is, is new. Uh, when you translate that into a business language of uh, transforming your business, uh, think about you know the, not extracting and storing and centralizing and batch processing and so on, but transforming your data as your customer is watching it, as your customer is experiencing uh, whether dealing at your retail store or uh, working with you and, and interacting with you in, in a live setting. How do you uh, make your business process closer to real time while knowing who the customer is and, and uh, what they might be interested in and whether they are out of stock at other store shelves and so on. Uh, these are things that are being thought about or imagined uh, when they know what technology can do. And uh, uh, as we evolve, uh, it's really now looking at uh, how do you uh, look at everything connected, right? When I say everything connected, um, if you look at the industry evolution, um, whether it's industry, uh, uh, the different industry revolution, one, two, three, four. Now, what is happening with machine learning, AI, cloud, IoT, Big data, all these convergences, industrial revolution four, uh, which is uh, which is transformative. Uh, it's it's a transformative at the entire global level, at a at a scale that has not been imagined before. Uh, in in my uh, awareness of uh, the recent last two centuries, uh, the in the World War period and post World War period had some of the biggest industrial revolution, including the automobile in terms of how the assembly lines were uh, designed, uh, people were employed, and, and how people and, and, and uh, machines coexisted to, to whether it's a manufacturer or assemble a car, uh, maintain the quality and safety guidance and regulations and so on. Now, if you fast forward that, now with the robots interacting with humans uh, and, and yet operating at a scale and speed much faster, um, then what is possible while being consciously aware of where a human exists when the robot moves and uh, making decisions on uh, from a part to uh, reading sentiments of a customer of what, whether they like the part to knowing whether the food that you're processing uh, is at the right temperature and quality that the customers 
like to using visual aids to determine whether if there is a uh, if there is a, if the fruit is uh, rotten or uh, if there is a, a dent in your um, in your product and so on so uh, and all of this being knowing this real time uh, is a, is a different way of thinking of how businesses are looking at innovation when we work with applying this kind of uh, manufacturing 4.0 thinking solutions emerge or 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 possibilities emerge where we now look at okay can i uh, make prediction on store traffic to can i uh, beat the current demand forecast accuracy let's say from 70 or 80% to 95% by continuously looking and evolving and self learning machine learning models or can i augment the workflows and process with the uh, ml models constantly watching on behalf of humans to um to intelligently analyze text be it whether customer support cases or uh, looking at uh, um uh, looking at uh, system logs to determine whether uh, the the part that's being manufactured is potentially defective or uh, even managing a inventory continuously right where at some point it at least for some of these cases it it becomes evident that uh, humans can never beat the accuracy level of machine learning model that, that doesn't mean it happens in most of the cases in some cases where the roi itself also becomes very evident in building these models there are some standard uh, methodologies that google given all the experience they have prescribed and this is something that we go through when we work with our customers essentially conducting a workshop in a proof of concept and then we roll this out what's interesting when we go through this is uh most people think that uh, knowing the best uh, best ml model or deep learning model is the core to the answer the and and in our case the uh, the core answer is found in the data exploration uh, not necessarily in the algorithm selection that's uh, once you gain enough experience you realize that that becomes a relatively easier part for most problems uh, but really understanding the right picking the right use cases exploring the data well enough to know where you enable the power of machine learning Uh, and and doing feature engineering which is step 4 uh, that's where the real value at the expertise is reflected and uh, then there are other elements of operationalizing uh, the model and so on which is much harder than people think right uh, even if you do a fantastic job of beating the uh, beating the current kpis and and everybody is super thrilled about launching a machine learning model but when it comes to actually going and educating the broader organization on what it takes and and how to operationalize and enable it and really understanding now you're trying to go and not only educate but they have their fears and worries and those fears and worries are not necessarily resistances or or, or they don't want to support you it's just that you have not answered some of their questions so there's a need for broader training and awareness which needs to be done top down and it's not always necessary the mid management who is uh, uh, who, who can be the bottleneck it could be even sometimes the top leaders because they have limited time and bandwidth to understand the power and capabilities and and it has to be presented in a way that they can comprehend and make reasonable decisions on how to enable this for the entire organization um with all these experience of conversing and working or interacting with hundreds of customers uh we have come up with these five simple steps which we think helps businesses transform and uh, the 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 key thing that starts off with uh, suggesting that you and there's a white paper that you can download from our website kudosan.com um you, knowing which problems you really want ml to make, to solve and make decisions um it is something very important where or in other words know when not to use ml um also know when you can economically feed data to the ml model either you have a label data or you don't have enough label data which means you have to go label the data for the last 5 years or 10 years it won't make economic sense but knowing that you don't have label data maybe you might want to start labeling data as a process now and a year down the line you might be ready for an ml model start thinking on those lines as well then look at ml ai as an innovation for the more most part and not sci-fi 
uh, when maybe 30, 40 years back when people spoke about connecting to computers as internet and people thought that it's sci-fi and it's a science experiment unless they saw some of the, until they saw some of their industries getting completely disrupted. Take travel agents as an example. There are no travel agents for the most part in the world that people do their own bookings. Then <clears throat> blend your business know-how into the model design, right? Uh, it's very tempting to go deep into the technology and and from my experience, uh, these platforms, uh, I can talk at least for Google Cloud, and uh, they're they are far, far advanced than what most customers think or, or need, right? Uh, or, or they think they need. Uh, it's really the uh, aligning the business problem, be it enterprise or mid-market, knowing what your business problem and how you align that with the model design is very important. The team that you put together have to collaborate very effectively. Um, then once you solve this problem, demystify the magic. Don't make it like this is a, a, a work of a genius or something like that where where others don't feel like they are, they are part of it and they, they can adopt it or or they can grasp it easily. If you really figured out and really understood the depth and mastered that you should be able to communicate in a very effective manner such that the broader organization rallies up. Uh, it could be all the way from top to the lowest engineer or or the person on the production floor uh, or uh, uh, in the, or a store manager in the retail store uh, or, a, or a nurse in a, in a, uh, in a healthcare uh, sector. You have to worry about the 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 common labor force in the in your industry or in your uh, in your uh, domain or in a company so that the adoption is much wider in summary um, here are some of my key takeaways uh, first is AI adoption AI machine learning adoption is a journey we have rarely seen anybody say, okay, this is a start and stop, and we are done, and either it works or it doesn't work. Uh, we have rarely seen that kind of declaration. Even if you look, learn something, you put a pause, then you come back, and you continue the journey. ML innovation starts with experimentation for the most part, right? Unless you really understand uh, your business well and you understand the technology well. Because the industry for the most part is still learning ML, and AI and so on, so it's, it's, it starts off with experimentation. Um, awareness is the first major step for innovation. Um, awareness to make sure that you're not only putting the right team, but also uh, and, and uh, creating awareness within that team, but also knowing what is out there, what problems have been solved, what mistakes have other industries and verticals made. Uh, these are things that when we engage with our customers, we try to emphasize first so that they are not out there trying to solve a problem which has already been either solved or which has proven to not work effectively. So save the money up front by driving better awareness. Awareness could be in the form of workshops, training, and so on. There's a lot of, while the internet itself is an amazing source, there's a lot of misleading uh, sources of the internet uh, which can drain your uh, money as well. Um, Another important point is what I emphasize is embed your ML into your business process, and not the other way around, right? Unless you're coming up with uh, 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 like um, this one customer uh, who deals uh, with uh, car insurance and, and so on, where they're going to totally disrupt the market, how insurance industry works, and there's no such business existing. Uh, that's a different case where you have to first innovate with technology, then Define the business process to align with the technology, but for the most businesses, it align business process first um, well with the technology. Uh, <clears throat> change management is much harder than it appears uh, with the MLAI and, uh, and and so on, and it's usually got to do with uh, uh, cross organizational commitments, how they are structured, how data is shared, how decisions are made and who owns the accountability of the decisions. Why should I trust the ML model output, even though you have convinced me that um, that you know your, your science project or whatever experimentation that you did is right, but I will not change my process of the way I do because of my 30 years experience. So you will hear 
that's the thing. So you, <laughs> you have to have a process, a change management process to overcome, uh, overcome these kind of obstacles or constraints. Um, in general, it's better to start the journey sooner if you're in a disruptive market. Uh, healthcare is a disruptive market in our opinion. Retail has been going through continuous disruption with online retailers to omni-channel and so on. Uh, there are other industries which will be caught by surprise, uh, but uh, each industry has its own um, mechanisms, uh, how it evolves and so on. So not all industries will adopt at the same time. And in some cases, uh, there are compliances that you need to worry about, which will not allow you to adopt even if you think it is the right, um, right solution for you to experiment with. So uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, and uh, <clears throat> at this point, I will take a few questions. I do see people uh, posting some questions. And uh, let me just... Make sure I read the questions. Okay, will you say that the ML is basically a glorified function picking exercise? If not, what is the difference, please? Right. Um, the way I would answer is, if I replace the word uh, ML with uh, uh, ML with uh, internet, uh, would you ask the same questions? Will you say that internet is uh, basically a glorified function fitting exercise? Uh, if the answer is, and, and you'll find the answer yourself, right? Uh, my view is uh, the following. One is, there is, uh, like every technology when it comes in, there is a lot of glorification that happens uh, because of there's a portion of the market uh, who benefit from the such glorification, uh, who may or may not carry the depth. And and in some cases, uh, they have to do it either for getting market attention, uh, for, for, for the product evolution, or the customers demand it, or uh, they're really trying to attempt, but you know, they've really not got the depth. So there is a, this is all part of the evolution, but uh, that's that's one section of the market, but then there's the other section of the market who truly are innovating, who truly are uh, gone to some incredible depth to transform industries. And some of the examples that I've seen, uh, it could be even startups. It doesn't have to be all these major enterprises doing. Uh, they are amazing. And and in the healthcare segment, for example, uh, I've come across use cases of scenarios where. Um, where, where based on those products, human longevity or life expectancy is expected to go up by 10 years. Who, wouldn't, who generally doesn't care about life expectancy? Uh, everybody, for the most part, cares about that. Uh, we see scenarios like that, right? And, uh, and Google themselves is heavily investing in healthcare, and uh, hopefully you'll hear some of the transformations in the coming year. Uh, could you please provide a link to the white paper you mentioned? Absolutely. Uh, please uh, send a note to contact at pluto7.com. Uh, it's on our website. If you can't find it, uh, we'll make sure that somebody gives it to you. Um, then uh, let's see, another question. Uh, you mentioned that not every problem is an ML problem. Are there any quick rules of thumbs that may help to decide if it is needed, uh, if it is indeed in a ML problem. Uh, here are some quick rule of thumb. Uh, uh, obviously, it's a much more deeper question. Where uh, do send me an email at uh, manju at pluto7.com, and I'll be glad to give you more uh, pointers and specifics. But uh, in short, um, if you look at uh, the, the general rule is, if you don't have data, there's no ML model for the general rule. I mean, but again, don't go by the that alone in the sense, you know, uh, think that, oh, you need 10 million rows of data. That's not what I'm saying, right? There has to be enough data, at least for the model to pick some patterns, number one. Number two is uh, have a feel for the ROI, right? If you can't imagine what the ROI is, don't bother experimenting because uh, you, you might be able to take a data, you will generate it, you will get some results and so on, and then somebody will ask you, so what, right? Uh, before you start an ML project, you should have a gut feel. If I get the accuracy from 90 to 
the the potential saving is x hundred thousand dollars or x million dollars and so on. So now when you're spending a fifty thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars on experimentation, your management knows that you're not you're not just shooting in the dark. Second, uh, third uh, problem is uh, our third rule of thumb is uh, if if you do end up going and building, make sure that you will have control and explainability, right? What I mean by that is sometimes when you build these models, they can get so complex and uh, that you know, the, uh, both from a computation standpoint and mathematical standpoint, that if somebody say, says that I, I really love your answer, so tell me how you got that. If you can't explain, they don't trust you. But even though it's right, and they know it's right, the problem is that there are there are scenarios where they have to worry that when, in the scenario when it's wrong, and if they if they went by the ML model and if they took action, the implication could be very high. It could be in the uh, it could be a matter of life and death in some case, or it could be a huge uh, revenue loss in some case. So uh, these are some basic rules of thumb. There are more, but we'll uh, share that as the follow-up. Um, then uh, will the slides be available? I believe uh, Bright Talk will publish this uh, along with the recording. And uh, if not, uh, again, uh, send an email or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I will uh, take care of that. Could you please, in the next question, could you please enumerate the steps on creating an ML model? You mentioned a few steps on creating data, feature engineering, any particular technologies you recommend? Uh, we have worked with various uh, public cloud vendors in the past, and uh, over uh, many years of experimentation, exploration, finally we settled on Google Cloud, primarily because Google themselves have been using machine learning models internally from search engine to YouTube to various aspects. Uh, and then there's a proven platform designed specifically for predictive analytics and so on. I'm, my own personal uh, experience comes from 17 years of predictive analytics work for 30 plus organizations. I started my career at Cisco. So uh, uh, to me, it's uh, the faster time to market and uh, an integrated set of tools so that not only from how you get the data in your store or, or you transform the data to uh, how you build an ML model to visualize the whole toolkit being available where I can put like two or three people to do the entire project, that's very key. Um, and for that, uh, our preference is Google Cloud, but again, uh, I would suggest do your own independent research on uh, Google Cloud, either on Gartner Forest, wherever you prefer, um, and then come to your conclusion. Because at the end of the day, the customers will have multi-cloud platform providers. Uh, on-prem generally doesn't make sense to me, right? You know, like people say, hey, we'll build an ML model in on-prem. Eventually they'll run that when the model gets complex, uh, they are not well equipped for uh, large scale computation and then they'll run into roadblocks. That's my observation for the most part. All right, um, I will share the slide one more time to, Right, to make sure that uh, you can see my contacts. Uh, again, I'll repeat verbally, my email ID is manju at pluto7.com, or you can send an email to contact at pluto7.com. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, and I'll answer some of the questions. Um, we have about 10 more minutes. I'll take a few more questions. What are some of the companies you have worked with uh, that you see uh, are experimenting with data use cases and who have succeeded with launching their experiment across the company. Uh, some of the case studies uh, we have published on our website and uh, take a look at it if you want to have a deeper conversation on especially enterprise-wide adoption, uh, feel free to send a note. Uh, but what I will tell you is um, uh, the Depending on which industry, I mean, we can only talk about four industry verticals, retail, high-tech manufacturing, and uh, healthcare. Uh, depending on the industry, there are some which are ahead, like retail, for example, right? They're far ahead in, in generally understanding the value of analytics and ML. Um, Company-wide adoption, uh, there are very few we see, uh, but uh, we do also see the sense of urgency for company-wide adoption. Uh, there are companies who start up with few ML models within six months come to realization that ML should be everywhere. Uh, 
but again they know it's a multi year journey there are uh, so it's a it's a spread of uh, companies but uh, there at the same time there are certain companies that we interact with uh, we don't necessarily have we haven't worked with them in enabling across the company we work in a certain departments uh, we have seen pretty wide adoption of machine learning and uh, uh, they and they are not always the new age companies some of them are uh, traditional companies as well okay i think i answered all the questions if there is anything and any additional follow ups i can uh, um, i can always uh, respond back to you uh, this is the last question that i'm taking you mentioned key is uh, you mentioned keeping an eye on roi looking at the investment uh looking at the investment what are the budgets required for an ml project i'll give you a general guideline or a, or a, or a number it depends which country you are belonging to uh, you have to adjust the cost accordingly ml projects and experimentations cost anywhere from $30,000 to $100,000 that doesn't mean that they always fit in this bucket sometimes it can go well lower than that or well higher than that depending on how complex your use case is how long it takes and so on but on on an average we have seen most of these projects executed in around 48 weeks uh with about 2 to 3 people that we can do the reverse math and what it will cost in your region and so on the key is to have uh, an expertise and know how of people have done this quite a few times because three fourth of your costs or wastage of money is saved just by getting the right advice at the right time so keep that in mind as you work on these um uh, and one more this is the last one absolutely the last one and uh, uh, we'll have to drop uh, i appreciate if you could share any best practices you can share for operationalizing productionizing uh, deployment of ml models and maintaining scaling it over time uh, changing business scenarios over time this is a pretty loaded question uh, it is Uh, it is like i mentioned it is a journey uh, some of the companies we have served in the past and now uh, these are fortune 100 companies uh, when we talk about uh, best practices for operationalizing and productionalizing ml models there are many elements people process data systems policies uh, technologies to um, uh, you know your ecosystem there are many elements you need to think about right uh, think about how uh, if you take an enterprise 30 years back and how they went about enabling enterprise right uh, how it changed the way their employees worked and and so on and what all they had to change in the enterprise and and it, it didn't happen overnight and and if you look at internet security today even in any of your companies there are still gaps that your it organization is fixing right so it's a uh, uh, it's on the same lines it's going to take a while uh, but some some companies uh or have already done it they're far ahead in it uh, i live in silicon valley so i have enough i'm fortunate to see some of these companies who are far ahead in this regard uh, so the, the at any given point in time it's highly unlikely that uh, nobody has done it or, or there are not enough companies out there to learn from uh, there are definitely enough companies to learn from and uh, we do interact with some of them and uh, hopefully this could be also one of my white papers that are probably draft in in the coming weeks or months so do expect that uh, again any more questions please reach out to contact at plurus7.com this video will be available i think by bright talk uh, on uh, on the website hopefully in in a few weeks and uh, thanks everybody for participating